Tom Clark's main event is a Boink Studios production. And now, on with the show. This is Daddy's show. Step off. Hey, hey, what is up? Welcome to the program, folks. Thank you for tuning in. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Tom Clark, and this is Tom Clark's main event. What's up, kids? Welcome back to the show. We just didn't even do the countdown today, did we? You know why? Because I made you wait two minutes, three minutes. Can't keep the good people waiting. All right. So happy Friday to you. Hope you guys are doing freaking fantastic. Hope you've had a great week. Hope everything's looking capital for you today. I am all situated. I got the laptop, the PC, the TV. I mean, it's it's command central here. This is the main event command center. I'm wearing the good shirt. You know, if I'm wearing the good shirt, it probably means we have a guest on the show. Shocker. It's not a shocker. If you've been watching the promotion, man, you know who we got on board today. So we hope you came for that. We hope you got some good questions loaded up. Before we get rolling with the man of the hour, um, let's say some quick hellos. My producer, Big Nate Dog in the house. Everybody, uh, send your best to Nate. Uh, he's got physical ailments happening, but I'm not going to tell you what it is, but he's he's good. Sugar Shane Odom, old school in the house. Gary Benfield, owner, promoter of High Velocity Wrestling. What's up, Gary? Uh, Guten Tag to Sandy in Germany. Hope you're doing well. Jamel in Vegas, what's up? Hey, hey, Shannon, how are you today? Russell Jackson, thanks for hanging out again, as always, man. Victor Vasquez, thanks for hanging out as well. Mark Gray, what's going on? Belinda, man, we got all the regulars here this week. This is always fun stuff. Jeff, what's going on, my friend? Christopher, what's going on? Ray Dean, Adam Cole fan, the house. My guest, uh, we, we might touch on him a little bit uh, here. Yeah, Ray's a big Adam Cole fan. So, um, uh, William, long time since you've been on. Yeah, man, we can we can talk about that as the show goes on. Uh, Bobby, doing well. Hope you are. Uh, and Elvis Martinez and a bunch more of you uh, showing up today. I appreciate it as always. We always have a great uh, turnout. We always have great fans, great viewers that come along for the ride on the main event. Let's get some tickers ticking. There it is. This is episode number 217. 17 weeks removed from the celebration that was episode number 200. Um, as we said before, kids, we do have a special guest here on the show. Um, we're going to go ahead and get to it here today. Yes, kids, if you've been watching the promotion, then you know that we've been teasing this thing for, I, I think I've been talking about this for a good month. Um, the man himself, if you are a, a fan of WCW, the good old days of the Monday Night Wars, and then on the tail end of that, if you're just a fan of, of good old fashioned professional wrestling, you're going to know who this guy is for sure. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the main event, the maestro himself, Mr. Rob. And I just took myself off the screen. Let's try that again, kids. There he is. Rob, what's up, man? Welcome to the show. Hey, uh, thank you for having me. Yes, sir. Hope you're doing well, man. Thanks for taking time out of your day. Um, we appreciate you being on. So we talked a little bit before we went live today. Tell the good people where you are right now what you're up to this weekend. Uh, I'm on my way to Florence, South Carolina for the uh, Power Comic Con at the Florence uh, Convention Center uh, tomorrow. For, I'll be there from 10 p.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Wow, cool. That, um, I, I, I imagine the social uh, distancing restrictions are in place and everything. Hopefully they still have a good turnout. What's the What number are they limited to? Have they gave you any specifics on that or anything? Because I'm just curious. I, I, uh, I, I really don't know that exact specifics but uh they're taking every safety precaution they possibly can uh, cool. for everyone but it, it should be a good time as, as always and uh i'm gonna be uh um uh, with my fellow cast members of the upcoming film i'm gonna be in called the devil's daughter which is a harlequin origin story so nice looking forward to that that's good stuff, man. We were going to get there eventually, but uh, if you want to touch on that a little bit before we get into the pro wrestling stuff, man, let's talk a little bit about the Hollywood thing that you've got going on. You've been very active for the past several years. Um, is that something that just kind of came naturally to you, or was it a nice segue from pro wrestling, or was it something you'd always wanted to do? Well, I, I, I took theater a uh, long time ago, 
and I was in several plays, uh, ha Hamlet, uh, Macbeth. I was the king that got betrayed in Macbeth. I was one of the cats in the Broadway play Cats. Nice. Uh, so several plays in, in, in theatrics, and which actually led me into wrestling, believe it or not. <laughs> wow. And then, and then, you know, gravitate into the film industry, which, uh, you know, I'm really fortunate to do both these days. So it's, uh, it's really cool. So, I mean, The Devil's Daughter is, a, like I said, a Harlequin origin story. And I star as Der Dr. Jeremy Arkham uh, in the film. And a lot of you Batman fans out there will rec recognize the character, <laughs> Dr. Arkham and uh, Harlequin. So a lot of well, Easter eggs, Batman Easter eggs in the upcoming film. Well, you've got a comic book nerd in, in front of you right now. And I'm, I'm sure a lot of the folks here are as well. So you're you're talking my language now with the comic book stuff, man. Uh, yeah. That's cool, right. dude. I'm looking. I'm looking forward to that, man, for sure. By the way, not to be rude, kids. I kind of forgot. Uh, Rob, these are the kids. Kids, these. This is Rob. Kids, say hello to Rob. Everybody, make him feel welcome. My apologies. Hi, I didn't everyone. formally didn't formally introduce you to everybody. We've got a very active, very vocal audience here. They they say what's on their mind, but all of them are very respectful. You guys will get along great. Uh, we've already got some comments. So before we dive too deep here. Um, let's go through a few things. Ray Dean says, Hey Rob, you are the man. Great finisher already getting some props. That's pretty cool. Hey, thank you so much. Yes, sir. Um, and you know, we were talking about, uh, cons, man. We, we typically, me and a, a few friends of mine would almost always frequent the heroes con in Charlotte and mm -hmm. went every year, been going for, I don't know how many years in a row. I'd went 20 some years straight in a row. And then, uh, last year happened, unfortunately. So it was called off, but man, it was it's right. always a fun time to go to those things, man. Uh, are you a comic book fan at heart as well, or is it the con circuit just part of the Hollywood gig and the pro wrestling stuff? Oh, absolutely. I've oh gosh, I used to have like a ton of comics in my collection, and you know, thirty years ago I was a kid, and so it's like uh, it, it, it was it was pretty much a natural thing to get involved in comic cons. I mean, I heck, I wish they had comic cons when I was younger. I'd, I'd be all over it. <laughs> Yeah, I actually didn't start. I didn't start going until '91, and that was the round about the year the image blew up. And uh, it's funny, I've been reminiscing over the image brand over the past few days and watching some documentaries that they've done for it over the years. And just such a fun time to be a comic book fan. Um, a lot of that, also, the fans will echo that sentiment that the best time maybe to be a pro wrestling fan was during the days of the Monday Night Wars. Um, and you know a lot about that, of course, uh, in your time in WCW. But let's take this thing back to the beginning. Uh, and I don't want to do like a, this is your life kind of thing, but let me start wherever, where a lot of guys start. Talk to me about your amateur career before you ever got into the pros. Oh, goodness. Well, um, let's see here. Uh, I was, uh, amateur wrestling for, for quite a bit. And, um, you know, USA freestyle Greco Roman and, and all that. So it's, uh, you know, it's been a journey, you know what I mean? And then, uh, and then from there, I, I was, uh, gotten pro wrestling through, uh, some, some old timers, uh, Gene Anderson, who was the, uh, one, one of the Minnesota Wrecking Crew, Lars and, uh, Ole Anderson, right? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I, Ivan, Ivan Koloff and, uh. Oh, we lost Rob. Uh-oh. I have no idea what just happened. We lost Rob. All right, kids. Technology, baby. What are you going to do? Everybody hold tight. We'll try to get them back in here uh, shortly. Um, hopefully, it's all good. Uh, let's see. Yeah, he'll he'll pop back in in a sec. Um, everybody just hang loose. These kind of things happen, man. This is, you know, no matter how good all this stuff works, uh, sometimes it uh, kind of goes... Uh, a little south on you. So hopefully that, uh, uh he'll be back in, uh, in any time now. Um, uh, we've got a lot of questions here coming in again, folks. We've hope you've had a great week. Hope everything's going well for you. Uh, it's funny cause doing some research for the, for Rob here today, man, I've been watching some old WCW stuff and in, in particular watching some of his old matches. Uh, and it's, it's fun stuff, man, to go back and reminisce. Uh, a lot of people again, talk about the attitude era and those days of the business being, the best time, I don't know if I personally agree with that because I grew up during the territory days of the industry, 
Um, and so that was sort of uh, my thing, and I still have a love for that. And of course, we'll talk uh, we'll talk some of the, uh, about some of that with Rob when he when he pops back in here. Um, but here's the thing, kids. Uh, uh, again, talking about the territory days. Big, massive shout out uh, and deepest condolences to the family of Jim Crockett Jr. Uh, you guys know that we lost Jim this past week. Uh, very sorry time. Very sorry to hear about it. And actually, we had lost Josephus just the week before. Two NWA guys gone. Of course, without Jim Crockett Jr., the NWA would not have flourished the way it did in the 1980s. The territory era, the Midland Championship Wrestling. Um, his influence and his stroke was felt throughout the business at that time, and it's still being felt today. If you're the Carolinas right now, then you know that this is Crockett country, man. Uh, you know how we roll down through here. It's always been referred to as flair country, and it is. Uh, but at the same time, yeah, it's it's also Crockett country for sure, and that's that's kind of the way I've always felt. So, yeah, again, uh, big uh, massive condolences to the family. Uh, we wish them all the best and, uh, uh, losing someone is not, not easy. As you guys know, uh, it's something that you, uh, you never really get past. You never really get past it. You just try to kind of get your way through it. Um, uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a big deal, man. Uh, bye, 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 bye. And let's take a few questions before uh, Rob pops back in. Andy says, Hey Tom, it's been a while. Hope you're well. So who do you think, uh, who we think the signing, <laughs> First of all, I love Big Show to Death. I love seeing him on Dynamite. Um, uh, I love all that stuff. At the same time, Show did call it evolution instead of revolution. It's okay. You get tongue tied sometimes. To hear the words AEW and and you know Tony Khan and all this other stuff coming out of his mouth, it's a different thing. Yes, uh, it, it, for somebody that we've always been associated with WWE and Vince McMahon. To put the words of another company into his mouth on live TV, that's a big deal, right? So, yeah, it um, uh, it's a different thing. It's a different animal to kind of see that stuff going down. But, you know, it is what it is. Um, I, I Honestly, I don't know if I have a take. I don't know if I want to set myself up for it to be some massive shock, some massive surprise, and then maybe we're let down. But I'll say this, I've given AEW the benefit of the doubt more often than not, because more often than not, they've never really let me down. And look, you you guys can disagree with that. You can uh, you can say that, you know, AEW lets you down all the time or what have you. But for me personally, I just don't feel that way. I mean, more often than not, the payoff for what they do in AEW is good. I don't have many complaints about it. Um, uh, so, yeah, Toby's guessing that the signing is Christian. I don't have any idea. Uh, who it is, um, I, I would tell you. Actually, I don't know if I would tell you if I knew. Spoiler alert. So, yeah, it's, um, we'll just see. I like surprises, man. I like surprises. Jamel says, Lash is the champ. Yes, sir. Um, I, I'm all for it. Um, I, I like the hurt business concept. I don't like that he's been sort of bogged down doing other stuff this whole time. But uh, we got the man back on on the plan here, kids. Let's get back to him. There he is. What's up, Rob? Hey, sorry about the connection issues. I'm back. <laughs> no, wor no worries, man. No worries. We were just fielding a few questions uh, from the main event faithful here and getting a few uh, um, uh, comments from them as well. Um, and I don't mean to bounce around on you on you too hard here or anything, but um, we were just talking about sort of the the modern day uh, business. How how much do you follow what's going on today in, in the big wrestling companies? Do you tune in regularly? Do you catch it when you can? Or, or where do you stand on that? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Uh, not only uh, to you know, stay in touch with my wrestling family, but uh, you know, I, I do weekly wrestling podcasts on VOCNation.com with WCW Retro and all that. So I try to keep – and uh, in the room also. So I always try to keep uh, uh, custom of what's happening – currently in the in the wrestling industry yeah i mean I, it's 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 hard to do a wrestling podcast and unless unless your whole gimmick is that it's the throwback it's it's on a certain time period it's hard to do a wrestling podcast unless you're staying up to date so i feel you there um this is a, a loaded question for you right off the bat here but what's some of your key takeaways from what you're seeing right now you're going to look at it much differently than anybody else would because you've been in the ring you know a, a lot of the nuances, you know, a lot of what you're seeing that maybe regular fans won't see or maybe they miss. Do you have any key takeaways from what you're seeing from the business today? Any concerns, anything you like, don't like? What's your overall take on it? Well, I mean, there's a lot of 
new generation of uh, guys and gals uh, working hard, doing their thing, and which is great because uh, the wrestling industry is like a cycle. You know, we're always giving mm-hmm. back to the new generation to carry on the industry and art because, you know, a lot of us veterans are not going to be around <laughs> that long, right? So we got to you know, pass on the craft. And um, I, 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 I think uh, as us in the industry – need to look out more for for their younger generation and to uh because you know they're, they're gonna be wants to carry the load more or less so uh but it, it's just great to you know you got aw you got some hungry talent there you got some hungry talent in nxt ring of honor uh new japan uh, and all these other promotions it's really really great to see so um you know I, I, it's it's good to see the younger generation carrying on that hunger and drive uh, for, for the business. And, you know, uh, uh, you mentioned AEW here and I, I, I peg you as being an old school guy. Cause I, I mean, I know I am and, and I've seen your work over the years and I kind of figured you could sort of be an old school guy. We've heard opinions of some old school guys who do not care for the AEW product. And that's putting it mildly. Um, uh, I, I don't know if I'm asking you to get critical of anybody, but you seem to be very open to the, to the new stuff. Do you get why some of, some of the guys maybe you've known in years past, and maybe still keep in touch with today, why they have such a problem with that company or what is it that, that makes your opinion like, like you're more willing to look at what they're doing and take it at face value versus, Hey, I'm going to scrutinize every single thing these guys and gals do. What is it about the way you see it? That's different from maybe some of your colleagues. You know, I, I, I totally get it. You know, coming from the old school background, and uh, even people in the company like Jim Ross gets it. I mean, you hear him make uh, remarks <laughs> every week about certain yes. things that he calls, right? So, I mean, it, and, and so does actually a lot of the younger talent in AEW gets it. Uh, you know, Darby Allen recently stuck up for Jim Ross, uh, for example, and uh, and everything. And and you know, for everything that they they seem to be struggling with as far as psychology of a match and certain things they do. Then, then they turn around and do something like a magic in the bottle the other night with Tully Blanchard, JJ Dillon, FTR and Sean Spears and the arm giving them the full horseman nod at the end. Uh, so it, it's like, you know, for, for stuff that they are lacking, stuff they are struggling with, uh, they come every now and then. You see some great things happen with AEW. I mean, you look at Paul White now; he's doing commentary with Tony Schiavone, and I mean that's that's huge news in the wrestling world. Uh, and he's te- teasing another big uh, jump <laughs> at the pay per view this weekend. So I mean, it's just, uh, but I can see where they're coming from because you know I, I struggle with some things too that I watch, and. Um, you know, I'm I'm really proud of FTR, uh, Dax Hardwood. I helped break, break him into the wrestling business, awesome. um, and, and I'm really proud of him and Cash. And I'm proud of all the the guys and gals I've helped over the years as well. You know, uh, you got the Luke Gallows, uh, Bobby Roode, Petey Williams, even Sasha Banks mentioned my wrestling school a long time ago. Bless her heart. So I mean, yeah, I'm 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 you know I'm rooting for these guys. You know. Because uh, these guys will be the ones that are paving. They're the ones that are paving the way right now. And uh, we need them to be the best they can be as far as storytelling, as far as entertaining us, as far as elevating wrestling to that next level. And, you know, I I, I think that uh, your attitude is very refreshing, especially for a guy that's that's been around for a little bit. I mean, I again, I hear opinions from other guys, and it's not quite as pleasant, not quite as reassuring. And I'm I'm always thinking there, there's this notion that, well, Tom, the business has to evolve. It has to change. It has to morph in order for it to be around for another 100 years. I mean, it, but at the same time, there is going to be basics. You, you, you have the consistent battle of good versus evil and right versus wrong. You can dress it up however you want to. You can come up with any match type you want to, put anything on the pole that you want to. It doesn't really matter. The fact is, it's still the dark versus the light. I mean, I think if the day ever comes, personally, that we get away from that is when we've lost the soul of the business. What do you say to that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, 
I mean, it's always been that way since the beginning of time and always will. And especially uh, the, with emotion. Emotion is so powerful in our business. And, and without emotion, I mean, we might not even like step in the ring and tell the stories that we tell. Because uh, if we can't connect with our audience, and, and, then, and that's another thing. You know, we, we're taught at an early age to respect our audience, and uh, of, no matter where they come from. So, you know, if, if, if it weren't for our audience, you know, we wouldn't even do what we do. So I agree with that. It's, it's a chicken and egg kind of thing, right? Because if no fans, there's no company and uh, it's, you know, you can make the, yeah, you can make the argument the other way if you want to, but I, you know, I mean, I'm part of a wrestling company and you and I have mutual friends through uh, uh, that company as well. And, you know, whenever we go to run an event, we want to sell the place out. It's not about, and I said this last week, it'd, it'd be great to have 20 people show up. I, we would do everything in our power to entertain those 20 people. We'd rather have 520 people. I mean, it's, you know, whoever shows up, we'll, man, we'll give them the best show possible. But, yeah, it's, about, it, putting, it's about putting butts in seats, about sending them home happy. And, uh, you know, that's what we're supposed to be about. Kids, if you're just tuning in and you don't know uh, what's going on in the main event today, the man you're looking at here is Mr. Rob Kellum, also known as the maestro, been a part of the pro wrestling business for a good long time, uh, worked his way up the ladder, worked and spent some time in uh, USWA, WCW, Smoky Mountain Wrestling. Um, listen, let's just call it for what it is. I was talking about opinions of, of other uh, um, veterans that are out there. Let's talk a little bit about Smoky Mountain before we jump too much into WCW. Talk about your time working for Jim Cornette at Smoky Mountain. Oh, it was tremendous. Uh, they were kind of the liaison at the time between uh, WCW and uh, WWE, right? right? And so they're they're actually looking at us to pull talent. And, you know, for, for young guys like myself back then, who I was known as Robbie Eagle, uh, along with, uh, you know, the Jerichos, the Lance Storms, Bobby Blaze, Taz's, uh, you know, this is a treat for us, you know what I mean? Because we're in, you know, when there were Kevin Sullivan, Rock and Roll Express, Heavenly Bodies, uh, Ron Fuller, Jimmy Golden, uh, the Moon Dogs, oh my gosh, mm. uh, Prime Time, Brian Lee, Tracy Smothers, uh, 30 White Boy, Tony Anthony, I mean, and the list goes on. I mean, it was and Tom, Dr. Tom Pritchard, oh man, it was just a tremendous time. And there's nothing like being in the smaller venue, right? Being that close to the fans, it's it's a much more organic feel. That had to have been a blast, also. Yes, yes. Um, and, and you know, I I'd, I'd wrestled independently a, a few years prior, right, to uh, being a Smoky Mountain wrestling. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, some of my first matches like was with what Chief Wahoo McDaniel, uh, Ivan Koloff, uh, Ron Garvin, and, and the list goes on. So I mean, that, that was great because I mean. It really paved the way, you know, to jump into a territory like Smoky Mountain Wrestling. And uh, those guys looked out for me. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's, uh, you know, and, of course, you know, I, I looked out for them. I was kind of like, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, back then, uh, the territories, you had, uh, you know, the policemen. And which uh, policemen, what a policeman is, is if anybody gives anybody in the company a hard time, then the company would send the policeman in to kind of like bring the whoever it is back down to earth, right? And that that was kind of like my deal. And because you know my my wrestling background, you know, shoot background and everything, and so. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was really cool, and it, and I learned a lot from those guys, man. And it, it prepared, and it and it really helped me uh, start when I started doing nightly shows with WCW and eventually USWA in Memphis. You know, we, we've heard stories over the years about wrestlers court and in, in the world of WWE, Undertaker was always the judge. And and yeah. usually usually if you lost the court case, you had to cough up a 24 pack or a 12 pack or whatever. Um, right. Did wrestlers did wrestlers court exist for you back in the day as well? Oh, God, yes. Oh, yeah. But, you know, it, it was just like for minor stuff. It was no, never anything serious. Too right. serious or anything is like I remember having wrestlers court one time about who, who to give whose ride to the town, <laughs> that type of thing. <laughs> oh man, it was pretty good. And yeah, I think Tommy Rich was involved with that. He was my uh, old tag team partner, uh, Wildfire Tommy Rich and Doug Gilbert. Oh, we were kind of like that had a favorite click there in Memphis, man, with uh, being with PG 13, and that was awesome. It's amazing. 
Man, Tommy and, and you know, the, the buzz on a lot of the buzz on Tommy over the years has been Tommy doesn't have the best body, but man, he can talk a streak and he's got heart and God, he can work like just God, amazing. Unbelievable. How much did you how much did you take from him just being around him? I mean, that must have been a, a great uh, learning uh, time for you as well. Oh, absolutely. I learned so much from Tommy. I still do. And we still keep in touch. And uh, I mean. It, it was just great. I mean, to see him come up with the angles for matches and the storylines and, and, and just putting things together, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, Tom, Tom was just amazing at that. And, and, and you had Doug Gilbert too, you know, his brother was, you know, hot stuff into Gilbert, right? Yes. And, uh, and, and his knowledge and, uh, man, the Gilbert family was being, a, you know, being a part of that, uh, dynamic with Doug, Doug Gilbert and uh, Tommy Rich was just amazing and 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 feeding with PG-13 was awesome and to actually main event the Mid-South Coliseum with, I mean with that's, all some, of us. that's something that's something to hang your hat on right there yes <laughs> right because you know only that nod usually gives the guys like you know Jerry King Lawler who had some great matches with by the way and I mean if you had if you had a bad match with Jerry Lawler something's wrong in the universe <laughs> and right, right, right. uh but and, and superstar Bill Dundee, you know what I mean? Those are the guys who get the nods. But, you know, we, we had a chance to mid main event Mid-South Coliseum. It was incredible, man. Just man, incredible. For, for fans watching and listening and listening maybe after the fact, if because a lot of people can't appreciate how red hot Mid-South territory was. If you, Dude, is there a way you can even put it into words, the atmosphere, the electricity? How do you get across to people who were never there or never saw it or never even saw it on tape? How do you get that across to someone to say, man, this place is insane right now? I mean, how do you even get that across to somebody? You know, there's certain arenas you go around the country and around the world that you just uh, get all at because of all the history going on. Because I'm a big history buff myself. Uh, right. you know, Madison Square Garden, uh, the, the old Keel Auditorium, the, old, uh, the Omni in Atlanta. Remember Omni Atlanta? Oh, yeah. Um, uh, to- the Egg Dome in Tokyo japan different places mm-hmm. like they have all the history but you know mid-south coliseum it was like the who's who the business was here i mean that you know andy kaufman's few with lawler started you here you know what i mean <laughs> it's just i mean hulk hogan macho man randy savage rick flair i mean the best of the best has been here at one time so it, it is a huge thrill yeah, you're right. The who's who of the business came through there. And, you know, Lawler's received crap over the years for like, oh, well, Lawler didn't travel the world and didn't work in all these other territories like the big guys did. And I'm thinking, he didn't have to. He made plenty of bank where he was. Yeah. Why would he Why would he want to travel the world and never see his family? He could just drive across town and be there. So, yeah, Amazing. again, I don't think people understand. And, dude, I'll be honest with you. I think you came along at the best time because it was the tail end of the territories Leading up into the big companies and the nationwide platforms, I th- dude, I think you came along at the best time where you weren't stuck in the territory, but then you also weren't the part of the new generation that didn't know what it was like to work in those in those areas. Man, I think you had the best of both worlds during that time. Oh, it was great. You know, Larry Booker, one of the Moon Dogs, he's the one that got me got me on to Memphis. Right, him, uh, superstar Bill Dundee, to a friend of mine, William Regal. Uh, yes, and um, and matter of fact, William Regal. And Dusty Rhodes uh, were were put in my head that my, my style and mannerisms favored the original Gorgeous George, right? And then it just kind of snowballed. And then finally, I asked my grandfather one day. I was like, "What's what's the deal? You know, why is everybody saying my mannerisms in the ring resemble Gorgeous George, right?" And he looks at me, right, and he says, uh, "You didn't know." <laughs> and I was like, didn't know what, Grandpa. And he smartens me up, right, and tells me that Gorgeous George was my granduncle, and that him, him, and uh, both of them were like amateur boxing buddies back in the day before he broke into business. So that's what inspired me to use the name Gorgeous George the Third for quite a while and honor him. I wanted you to tell that story. I didn't want to tell everybody here, but yeah, kids, you're you're talking to someone descended from pro wrestling royalty for sure. I mean, you watch those old matches and those old clips and. He was doing stuff in his time that they're still trying to do today to get over and get heat. And you watch those old tapes, you're almost like, is this Hollywood or is this real? Because the way he carried himself <laughs> and he was flamboyant. And I remember that one spot where they're, they're, they're running the ropes and instead of going back to his opponent, he just stopped and started prancing around the ring. And I said, right. oh my God, I'm so tuned in for this man. <laughs> um, and you know, without Gorgeous George, you don't get Adrian Street. You don't get... 
a plethora of other talents. And honestly, we don't get you as well. I mean, um, let's go to a few comments here because this got me thinking about it. Shane Odom says, because he's got a question. Why did you change your right. gimmick uh, from Gorgeous George to the Maestro? Talk about that segue between being Gorgeous George and taking that name to becoming the Maestro in WCW. Well, uh, that in itself was quite a journey, actually. Um, I, uh, I just, um, you know, I was doing a mature Puerto Rico, right? And mm. I, I got the call from uh, Macho Man Randy Savage that and him and Hogan had contacted Jerry Jarrett, who was a good friend of mine, and uh, and they were wanting uh, to take a look at me to try out uh, for a, a WCW Nitro, right? So they flew me from uh, Puerto Rico to the Nitro to uh, have a tryout match. And uh, my tryout match was uh, Jeff Farmer, who was like the later became the NWO Sting, right? Right. And and I got to meet uh, Paul White, you know, who was known as the Giant, AK Big Show, right? And all the all the cats there and uh, Eric Bischoff. And uh, and they were going to do a deal where they wanted to give the, the name to Lanny Poffo, right? And bring me in under the whole new persona if you will and it didn't quite didn't work out neither one of us at the time and so i just went on uh becoming you know staying with gorgeous george the third and doing my thing and that did trip uh, tour of mexico with triple a with jake the snake roberts we were in triple mania that year i think it was 97 i believe right. and uh, which, which was huge it was, it was like uh they're equivalent of WrestleMania. I mean, they had like uh, valets dressed in a different personas <laughs> walking us through the ring and pageantry. It was just amazing. Um, and, and being there with some uh, AAA uh, veterans and legends like Paraguay was uh, tremendous. And you had Octagon and, you know, you had Rey Mysterio there one time, Conan and all that. So it, it was pretty awesome. And then I got uh, another uh, contact. Again, I got another tryout match during WCW and it was with uh, Chavo Guerrero uh, Jr., which I, I couldn't be happier because I had much love and respect for the Guerrero family. And I mean, we used to pray together before matches, right? Oh, wow. That's and, awesome. And then uh, after the match, uh, I remember all the boys in the back were like uh, giving us props and, you know, Diamond, Diamond Dallas Page come up and he's, man, bro, that was like years, man, that was incredible, right? And it was cool. And all the agents, I <laughs> check this out. All the, all the agents come up to us, you know, it's like, yeah, great match. If you, you know, if you uh, could have done this or could have done that. And everybody told a different story. You didn't know which one to believe. Right. And so I kind of remember back to when my grandfather always told me is like, I always know who the boss is. Right. <laughs> right. So er Eric Bischoff walks in the room. Right. And he says, uh, great match, guys. And he looks over at me and says, you know, we can use a good talent like you. Welcome aboard. And as soon as he says that, all the agents changed their tune. It was like, oh, great match. That was awesome. That was oh. tremendous. And I knew right then if I had a problem, Eric was the guy to go to, right? And I remember walking out the door. There was like all the boys there, including Arn Anderson, shaking my hand, welcoming me to the company. And it was like one of the greatest feelings in my life. <laughs> it was tremendous. Just the feeling of you made it. Uh, yes. Uh I mean, and you know, we, we've heard stories, horror stories over the years about when that company was really on its last legs about how there was too many bosses, too many guys calling shots and too many talents oh, yes. call, calling their own shots. You never came off to me as being a guy who was like, well, I have to have this and I want the music here and I have my hair has to be this way. And I mean, what do we know watching just on TV? But through the years, I don't think I've ever read or heard or, say, or seen anything to lead me to believe well, I mean, Maestro was a prima donna, and he was one of those guys that was calling us on shots. It just seemed like, man, I'm here to do a job, and let's just let's just have fun and do this. I mean, that seemed to be where where you were coming from. Let's just let's just do business. I mean, I, in that way, I think you were separate from a lot of your peers at that time. Not to bag on anybody, but it just seemed like, hey, I'm not here for that fluff and and nonsense. I just want to work. I mean, that must have been just the best time for you. And, and, and it, yeah, it, it just, things just happened. It just flowed. You know what I mean? And I was just really blessed from one opportunity to the next to make things happen. And I know when the gorgeous George the third deal, I, I, I kind of joke around with some people that knew me back then because you know, I kind of lived 
live to deal, for example. I, I had people doing stuff for me, and <laughs> it was pretty wild. But in fact, uh, when I first met Jake the Snake Roberts, right, and he's not only is he a mentor, he's a, one of my best friends in the business. And that's in that's in with Jake. That's how I met Diamond Dallas Page and Raven and Steve Austin. And, all. and well, when I first met Jake, right, you know, I was doing my Gold Gorgeous George deal. You know, I was having someone carry my bags, doing my, you know, stuff like that. Of course, I've asked him nicely. Of course, I wasn't right. You know, but, <laughs> but Jake, Jake was like, "This guy's such a jerk. He's so arrogant." No, that did Jake start thinking? Wait a minute. This guy's working me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's how we got to be friends, right? Because <laughs> he found out I, I wasn't any of that. I was like, you know, totally opposite. But I was just like working, working the persona. You know what I mean? So, uh, right. yeah, he, he was impressed. <laughs> and for, for Jake to be impressed, that means something. You know, we've we've always hear about the the young boy system in New Japan and 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 how it how it is in that country in terms of, you know, it's the black trunks, the black boots. You carry the bags, you do the laundry, yes sir, no sir, and and you're learning your craft the whole time. I mean, uh, when it comes to uh, wrestling here in the states, I mean, when you were coming up, was it sort of a very like a hierarchy, like you knew this guy's got more time in than I do. I'm going to follow his lead, and it's one of those things where not where you're bowing down to the guys above you, but you're you're taking what you can and you're showing respect. I mean, I think that in some circles that could be a lost art in today's business. I mean, you saw a lot of that coming through, I'm sure. Absolutely. We always respect the veterans and have them help us out, and especially in match situations. Anytime I was in a match with a veteran, I knew it was going to be a night off because all I had to do is just listen to them and it was, everything's going to be all right. You know what I mean? Most of the time anyway, <laughs> but, but, um, yeah, that deep respect, man, goes way back. I mean, it's just like family, you know, you respect your elders and their knowledge and you know what they can do to help you out. And, you know, you always want to keep an open mind, be like a sponge and listen to as much advice as you can. They even like the car rides and the plane rides to, to different towns and arenas, you know, when you're with some of the veterans, I mean, that's actually that's the time to be under the learning trees you can learn a lot from traveling with the veterans of the business it's just incredible and i i did i learned so much and i'm very eternally grateful for that yeah i mean you you're in a car for two to four hours maybe depending on where you're going and what else you're going to do except talk and you're going to talk business i mean it makes perfect sense Ray chimes in with, did you have a manager? I know the answer to that, but let's talk about uh, uh, <laughs> your manager, your manager slash valet in WCW. Yes, uh, Symphony, Alicia Webb, who was also known as Rian Shamrock at WWE, uh, total sweetheart. And today, to this day, just, just a great lady for sure. And um, uh, it, interesting enough, uh, I was, there was two before, um, symphony came along there was two picks i had for to be my manager actually uh, one was uh, bobby heenan in which oh, uh wow. being being with robbie and gene oakland was was great i used to love hanging out with those guys but bobby almost he wanted the gig but he was too busy you know doing the commentary thing with shivani right right and um cherry martell almost had the gig which i was very excited about because you know oh, her wow. history of with you know, like Shawn michaels harlem heat but, uh, but yeah, but yeah, um, uh, nothing but love for, uh, Alicia, man. I mean, she, she was awesome and it was, it was great. One of my first, but matter of fact, Jim Cornette was one of my first managers back in the day, Smoky Mountain Wrestling. Nice. Uh, br briefly. So, and I've, I've like, uh, downtown Karen in Memphis, uh, Harvey Wiffleman, uh, you know, I've had various ones over the years. <laughs> see i always knew i always knew harvey is downtown bruno so i, I you know downtown bruno uh, right yeah you know what i mean but yeah i uh, uh you know the the idea of well you're going to wwe they have to own the name and all this other stuff and I, I got feelings on that but you know who am i it's just uh one fan's opinion right but uh uh talk to me about uh, uh where you were at the time and and the culture of wcw and I, I guess what I'm asking is the whole maestro gimmick. How much of that did you have personally? How much input did you have from, you know, wardrobe to hair, to the piano, to, to her name being symphony? How much of that was you? How much of that was them? It was kind of give and take, you know, I had to meet uh, Eric Bischoff to kind of work things out at the time, um, you know, to, to create the maestro. And my envisionment of the maestro was, uh, 
it didn't really come out to later on in my WCW run where I envisioned the maestro was more of like a fan of the opera type, had like a dark side. And it, and with that, that later on in my WCW run when I was here, bad music and just snap and go psycho and ballistic. Um, that's, that was kind of like the envisionment I ha- originally had. But um, I mean, I, I can't complain. I mean, uh, they, they gave me a really good push and, um, and, and especially, I see, I was on the road quite a bit with uh, J- Chris Benoit and the, the Dean Malenko's, Perry Saturns, and all that, right? And then when, when all those guys left, I was like, oh, my God, what's going to happen, you know? <laughs> right, right. And, but things started rolling for me, man. And uh, I remember one time being on the uh, WCB Thunder with uh, Bam Bam Bigelow, which was huge for me. I mean – because I had a lot, a lot of respect for Bam Bam Bigelow, and I'm thinking, man, just, I'm just, this is the guy just, that was like in WrestleMania, Lawrence Taylor, man, and and one of the greatest big, wrestled Andre Giant, one of the big, greatest big men in our industry, and it was just like uh, huge. I mean, it was it was really uh, cool for me to be in the ring with Bigelow, and so uh, I'm just giving one of many examples, right? And um, Matter of fact, uh, the uh, my deal with David Flair actually was uh, was going to lead into an angle of uh, Ric Flair at one point. Nice. And I was very excited about that because, you know, I, oh, I love Rick, man. He, he's, he's, he's amazing. We, we talk quite a few times. I mean, not just in WCW, but even before then. I mean, he was like one of the first wrestlers I met, him at Blackjack Mulligan in the convenience store, right? Helping them with their drinks or vehicle. When I was younger, and then they, when I got in the business, they actually remembered me helping oh, them. Oh wow! <laughs> they got me a drink. Yeah, <laughs> unbelievable. That's crazy. Right? So, um, yeah, I was really excited about that, man. I had, and then, you know, of course, uh, a lot of greats there: Roddy Piper, um, and you know Scott Hall, who I used to team with in Memphis when he was Razor Ramon. As a matter of fact, one of the first things he said when I uh, started WCW in the office, right? Him and Nash walked in the room, and Scott looked at me and said, Hey, you call me George, right? Hey, yeah. George, remember we used to beat up Lawler in Memphis? <laughs> 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 like, oh my God. But uh, yeah, yeah, it, it, it was a good, yeah, the Meister was great, man. And Norman Smot, the, you know, Norman Smiley, Buff Bagwell, Ernest the Cat Miller, and, and the many others that I've had the pleasure of stepping in the ring with, man. And it, that was the thing about WCW, man. One night you can be in there with um, Rey Mysterio, and the other you can be in there with, uh, like, Macho Man. and uh, It was just uh, an amazing, amazing time. And I was just as blessed to be a part of it during that great run. You know, talking about the gimmick, man, you, you wore that gimmick, uh, and it looks so good. And... You know, we always, you talked about the business being cyclical and I I totally agree with that, but I've been in my head trying to remember who did this before you and who's done it since. I, I I mean, you can say there's variations of it since you've done it, but this idea of I'm, I'm the, I'm the maestro, I'm the one leading this and, and I'm, uh, I'm the master of ceremonies and this is my show and this. I don't know that I've seen anybody do that since you did it. And her name being Symphony was perfect. And and the look you guys had together. And I, I don't know, man. And I'm not blowing smoke on you here. I just don't know if anyone's done it that way since you did it. I mean, um, it, it just seems like one of, in my opinion, one of the most original gimmicks I think I've ever seen. But what happened for me was whenever the bell rang, suddenly it's it's not that it's not that the gimmick was gone, but man, you were in, in my in my head, getting after it, like, like dude, you attack that mat like a madman every time. I'm telling you, like, I, I go back and watch your matches now. And I'm like, I don't know if people at the time could appreciate the effort you were putting in uh, for the guy that you were working with, and man, that had to have meant something to everybody you did business with in the ring because I could see it from a distance for sure. Oh, it, it was just uh, you know, it's the way I was brought up in the business. I mean. Uh, uh, you know, you got the had the workhorses back in the day. You know, Tully Blanchard, Arn Anderson, Ric Flair. Uh, you had the guys that would could take, wrestle a broomstick and have a, a great, phenomenal match. And the Bobby Eaton's, you know, uh, Dennis Condor, Minna Express, Rock and Roll. Um, 
guys like that that made R- Ricky Steamboat, you know, and the guys oh. that and I've I've personally been blessed to be in the ring with and learn from and and to adapt to each one of their styles. And the one common thing that they had is no matter who in the ring with and what situation they're in, they, they would create magic. You know, what I mean, with with their timing and and they know what to do, what not to do, and the, the pacing. And it's, it was just incredible. I learned all that from them. And to uh, be in the learning tree of those guys, man, you, you you pick up some great stuff. <laughs> you really do. And I'm really, I was really blessed to uh, get get myself in, in really peak condition back then. Because uh, I, I would train like a track star, man. I would constantly run and uh, be in the gym and do my thing. And and, and see Ric Flair uh, do like a Hindu squats for an hour before a match was inspiring. And uh, it was just, uh, it, it was just great. And, and Telly Blanchard, you know, I mean, was always in phenomenal shape. Still is, actually. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, those those guys inspired me to really push myself and um, and and to learn, you know, like a psychology psychology of a match. Because you know, you know, our philosophy is you want whoever you're in the ring with to be ten times better when they come out, no matter what happens. Right. Because they and and to, that's the sign of a true workhorse in the industry. And, and that's what kept Flair on top because uh, no matter when, when the, when the chips were down with the promotion, um, they, they brought in Flair to, to lift up business because they knew he can uh, elevate and make it right. And we, we need more people like that in the industry. Cause it's all about, Hey, if both of you have the mindset of I'm going to make my opponent look better than he could with anybody else, then it's a win for both of you and a win for the fans because they're going to get a great match out of it. So, absolutely. And FTR is doing it right now. AEW. I mean, it's like no matter if who's on the roster, what tag teams on the roster, whether they're going after the championship or 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 you're just debuting or what have you. I mean, don't don't make them look like a million bucks. Yeah, it's it's the give and take, and 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 it's the old saying goes, shine them up, right? Make them look good. I mean, if if everybody's got that intention of let's get let's put the business over, not just myself, then yeah, you're. I mean, and then the the guy that you work the next night is going to want to work you because he saw what you did the night before for the other guy, and he's going to be like, hey, that I, let me work with Raw because look what he did for the guy over there. I mean, it's it's a chain Absolutely. reaction, isn't it? I mean, one hand washes the other, right? So. Yeah, I mean that's the way it used to be, giving back to the business, elevating each other. I mean, it it wasn't a, you know, it wasn't what you see much like with today. You know what I mean? It was isn't trying to tear someone down. It, it's to elevate everyone involved. You know what I mean? That's that's yes. that's how you tell a story, and that's because and once you get the fans' emotional connection in in the mix, it, it's it's a beautiful thing. It really is. Um. Toby chimes in with Rob, uh, the, who's, who's the best technical wrestler that you've ever seen personally? We can tweak that and say, who's the best technical wrestler that you've ever faced in the ring? Do you have one that jumps to mind? Oh, gosh. Oh, man. That's a hard one, right? Because you worked a lot of good guys in those days. I mean, you're talking Dean Malenko, who, whose, whose family is one of the greatest res, wrestling families ever. Hmm. Um, uh, William Regal. Hands down. I mean, if this business was this business was a, a total shoot, guys like William Regal and Haku would be uh, world champions ten times sober because these those guys are double tough, man. And they're some right. of my best friends. You guys got them, Fit Finley. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh my gosh. I mean, the, the list the list goes on. I mean, so yeah, yeah. I mean that 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 did definitely be some some of my picks. I mean, we're seeing great things from Haku's sons, Gorillas of Destiny in New Japan. We're seeing great things from David Finley's kid uh, as part of Finjuice. I mean, the next generation is is rolling on, man. But, yeah, it all started with you guys um, uh, back in the day. Uh, Sugar Shane asks, how was your relationship with Lance Russell and Dave Brown? What a fantastic combo those two guys were, man. I love those guys, man. They're, they're amazing. And you couldn't ask for two nicer guys that were willing to help and do what they can for you. Um, m- always much love and respect for uh, Dave Brown and uh, Lance Russell. Man, I, I miss him. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. I, I can't imagine. Um, Will asks, how big of a culture shock and change was it from AAA to WCW? Ah, uh, well, 
you know, it really, actually, AAA really helped me get accustomed to and prepare myself for WCW because, you know, when I got to WCW, you know, you had all these different styles. You had the European style. You had the, the guys in Japan, guys and guys in Japan. You have uh, the guys from uh, Mexico, you know, email and AAA and all that. So uh, it was just kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I did do the tours like I did because, you know, it, it just prepared me to jump to that next level. So, and, and I saw some cool familiar faces too, as well. And so it, it, it was a good, it was a good time. And, and it, you know, you're, you're thinking, it's like, okay, now I see why I went to this place and that place to prepare myself for this one. Right. So it all made sense. It all intertwined together, you know, and they're, they're a lot looser with the way they work in Mexico, like no tagging in and out. And it's, <laughs> you know, you oh, got, yeah. you got, you got the valets everywhere in the ring girls and it's a different presentation, but it's what they're used to. Uh, I'm curious, you mentioned Puerto Rico earlier and I'll, I got to ask you about that because man, we again talk about fans hearing stories over the years, but how volatile was Puerto Rico at any given time? I mean, did you work heel when you were there? And if so, how many batteries got thrown at you? Cause man, <laughs> <laughs> I know if you're brawling with a guy like Abdul the Butcher and you're more scared to death of the crowd than you are of him and he's like protecting <laughs> you from debris and you're telling Abby, thank you, thank you. That says something. Oh, my God. That's <laughs> the, the third, best. The emergency lane is like the third lane down there. Man. And, I mean, my, my pillow used to be thumping all night because he had fiestas all the time, you know. Wow. And yeah, But it was, it was great, man. Uh, we toured the island. They had strong TV. Um Wrestling with uh, Carlos Cologne was, uh, yep. you know, Calito's dad was a big, big thrill. And, and being down there with uh, some other friends, you know, Sean Morley, Val Venus, uh, uh, Dutch Mantel, uh, Rex King at the time, uh, uh, Vito LaGrasso and a few others was, you know, I mean, and got, I got to reunite with my old tag team partner from Memphis, uh, King Mabel, Bill nice. Viscera there. Viscera, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. He's he's one of those guys that I, I felt that uh, uh, the viscera thing was uh, was right down his alley, and it's it's funny that he he got that toward the end because uh, almost like well every he did the other stuff before that was okay, but then when he got that, it just seemed to be like oh man, this is him, this is totally him. I mean, yeah, um, it, it it's funny how some guys go a long time in their careers and they hit that one spark, and all of a sudden they just uh, they just blow up for sure. Um, Oh, right. It, it, sometimes it takes time to find themselves. In, in, right. In yeah. Business. Yeah. Let's see. Ray asks, how did you come up with your finisher? Uh, which one? <laughs> That's a good question. He didn't elaborate, did he? What was your go-to finisher in the ring? I'll put it that way. Oh, I had several. Um, you know, uh, you know, when I first started, uh, it had different suplexes. Uh, matter of fact, I had a match with Taz. Uh, Darren spoke about wrestling. All we did was suplex each other the whole match. It was wow. really fun. You know, it gets both had an amateur background and and everything. So yeah, it was great. But uh, like when I got to WCW, now I was doing the shoulder breaker in uh, Mexico for AAA, right? Right. But in um, WCW, uh, went with the Encore, which was like a version of uh, STF. Uh, yeah. to step over to a hold face lock, which which I I learned that from uh, Masahiro Chono. Nice. And which uh, he was uh, trained by a guy that I used to call for advice early in my career if I you know need some help, which was uh, the great Luthez. So can't get much bigger than that. So I did that for a while, and then towards the end of my WCW run, I was doing a modified Cobra Clutch called Dakota, which in musical terms means the end. <laughs> right very good and uh i uh but as far as the musical end of uh the maestro deal persona uh i collaborated with jimmy hart for that actually which was you know which was cool because we we're both from you know, the memphis area and you know everything and uh and he had you know he had that musical background and you know, he was with derringer one time right and, yes um, yes so uh it was great to work with jimmy on that you know he the sheet music and all that sort of thing. So yeah, and he helped put it all the elaborate. Kendall Opera had to the set when I come down the baby grand piano and everything, and 
Yeah, it was really, it was really cool. Yeah, Jimmy's a great guy. Did he ever sleep? Because it seemed like he was always bouncing off the walls. <laughs> oh yeah, I wish I had some of his energy. <laughs> I'm telling you. Uh, I don't know. Tell- Orndorff, Orndorff uh, would uh, <laughs> would uh, defer that one. Uh, I, I remember. Well, what happened was I was training the power plant uh, a few months prior to my debut, right? Right. And uh, I was on the way there to Smyrna and flying there actually in a, a big Reese. Big Reese uh, was on the seat next to me, right? And uh, he was like squishing me next because I was sitting next to the window, of the plane, right? And he was like, squishing me, laughing me and at me and everything. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, you just wait, bro. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we get to the power plant and then we're doing these kicking drills to, you know, for training, you know, to help our cardio. Right. And it just turned out, this so happened that they put Reese with me. Right. Right. <laughs> so he was, so I started kicking him, just stomping a mud hole as they say. Right. <laughs> and at the point he couldn't even, I blew him up. He couldn't get up. <laughs> and Paul, Orndorff, <laughs> afterwards, Paul Orndorff took me to his office and he says, you know what? They used to say I was crazy, but you're a maniac. <laughs> and I told Paul, all I, all I could think about was that dadgum <laughs> plane ride with him squishing me over there. <laughs> I bet he never did that again. So there you go. Nah, I, he was cool <laughs> after that, right? Yeah. Uh, Toby asked, did you ever work Bruiser Brody? Oh, have we lost him again? We may have lost Rob. Hold on, kids. Brother, if you can hear me, I can't hear you. I think you might have froze up on us. Yeah, yeah, we've lost him. We're at the top of the hour. I don't want to sign off this way. Uh, technology, baby, what are you going to do? So, uh, kids, this is a fun show, isn't it? Uh, I love getting stories, man, for real. Ah, uh, we got him back. There he is. Hey, sorry about that. No problem, man. I laughed so hard I knocked myself out of connection. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so we had a question. Uh, did you ever work Bruiser, Bruiser Brody? Oh, man. Funny funny you mentioned him, man. Um, he was like when the, him and Stan Hansen were two of the first people I actually seen in live wrestling. You know what I mean? Wow. And yeah. which uh, I was so – and back then I was really fascinated with pirates. So I would always call him Blackbeard. Every time I'd see him, <laughs> right. and he would get a kick out of it. He elbows, hey Stan, he called me Blackbeard. He, he he digged it. He's always cool, right? And oh, they were my heroes back then, man, Brody and Hanson. And I, I'd wished I wished I did more with them once I started the business because I mean, to them they were like the cat's meow, man. They were like, yeah, you know, they, they were like my first true pro wrestling heroes at the time, and him and Hanson. And not for nothing, but if you're working Bruiser Brody back in the day, then you're probably going to have a pretty good payday yourself because, man, he was – him and Hans were writing their own checks in Japan, man. I mean, there were stories yeah. of them of them coming back to the States with duffel bags full of cash. I yes. Mean, and I'm, wow. Right. I remember Steamboat telling me one time that when back when him and Jay Yumble were teaming up, right, that uh, they had a match with uh, Brody and Hanson there in Japan. And they're thinking, well, you know, we're, we're feeling not see how it goes. You know, they're thinking they might, they could, uh, you know, they might blow them up, right? The right. ring. But uh, he said when the match started, he said, he looked at Jason, my God, these guys could go because, I mean, Hanson and Brody were just back and forth with Jay and Ricky all over the place, man. And it, he's, he's, he said those them as a team was just amazing. I don't think we've ever seen a duo like them. You could say Hawk and Animal maybe, but in terms of explosiveness and and the ability to draw money and the ability to put a crowd not only on its feet, but run from you when you go through the crowd, I mean, my God. Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't know that we'll ever see a team like them again, man. I mean, that's, that's some crazy stuff. Um, it really is. Right. A lot of people during the chat today have mentioned the cat. Talk to me about Ernest Miller, man, about what it was like uh, working with him in WCW. Oh, Ernest Miller, great guy, man. So entertaining. Um, I mean, he's a three-time karate champion, and that's all legit. Let me tell you. <laughs> I, I remember some of the house shows we did, right? And uh, 
and he would just do his karate bit and I would just, you know, do the wrestling bit. It, it, it was great. And he was such an entertaining guy that, you know, he made everything he did work. And, and he was, it was a lot of fun being around us because he never, because he, he, we would think about ideas together and everything. And, and the whole deal with James Brown was just, uh, it was just so epic, man. It was, it was amazing. That's great stuff, man. Uh, what was he like behind the scenes? Was he was he open to? Because I mean, he's Mister Show Business, so that must have been what he was on his mind. Let's go give the people a show, right? Oh yeah, he was so cool, so respectful. Matter of fact, he was telling stories about my granduncle because oh. Gorgeous George inspired him, and and I was you know, meeting guys like him and you know Muhammad Ali, you know, and hearing what Gorgeous George did for them, right? It is it, you just get goosebumps, you know, and. Yeah. Um, so it is great. I mean, yeah, we're a class that guy. And, and man, when he came, made his entrance, uh, there at Super Brawl with us, with the cat and I, man, oh my God. I mean, the roof just came off. That's good stuff. That's, that's some uh, amazing memories right there. Uh, we've talked a little bit today about, uh, what's going on today, uh, in the business. I'm curious, how would you feel about coming back at some point if, uh, a W W W or whatever. Maybe it's a manager role, or it's maybe a coach behind the scenes. Would that be something you'd be interested in at some point? Oh yeah, the sky's the limit. You know, what I mean, I mean, whatever I can do to give back to the business. You know, that's that's. I mean, I love pro wrestling, and you know, I mean, we're family. I mean, once you're in, you're in. You know, what I mean, <laughs> no matter what. So right, right, uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, you know, whatever I could do, um, yeah, to help. Because uh, you know, I always always have love for professional wrestling. You know, you know, I could be acting for t- television and film and doing the other things, but pro wrestling will always be uh, a big love for me. Well, let me hit you with this. I don't know if anyone's asked you that during the course of the show here today, but um, looking back on it, is there anybody that? And I don't ask if you got regrets. That's such an odd question for anybody, in my opinion. But is there anybody that you that you look back on and say, "God, man, I wish I could have worked that guy. I wish I would have had a chance, just one match with somebody." Is there anybody that sticks out for you? Yeah, I've, I've been really blessed. Uh, you know, I've I've worked at Dusty Rhodes, uh, the Big Flares, Ricky Steamboats, and the list goes on and on. Um, I think one the one one the main guy I I would have loved to step in the ring with would be Kurt Angle. Mm. Just just because the fact that he, he as we like to call a brother of the mat, you know, I mean he, he's amateur wrestled, collegiate wrestled, uh wrestled the Olympics right. and and everything and um which I uh I came one match shy of qualifying for the, the team. <laughs> oh wow. Because I was a USA freestyle cracker Roman, and you know I got to train with the, the Iowa Hawkeyes, and uh, you know when I was doing it. So I mean, I had I had a really good run, and you know I I try to give back, helping out some of these kids, some of these tournaments sometimes, and doing all I can. So, but uh, yeah, Kurt Angle would be the guy because I've always had a deep respect for him. Um, well, he's accomplished. I mean, you have to understand the Olympic athletes like him, for example, Ronda Rousey. Mm. And um, the Dan Gables, I mean, they're like a breed above your normal athlete. I mean, your normal athlete trains hard, but your Olympic athlete is just on a whole new stratosphere. Yeah. Got to be in peak physical condition for sure. Um, mm-hmm. Toby asks, uh, uh, do you have any advice that you'd give a young person wanting to get in the business? Well, it's persistency. Persistency pays off. You got to, just, you know, believe in yourself and other people believe in you. Um, learn from the right people that have been there and done that, that could help you. Keep yourself physically and mentally in good shape. Um, try not to get involved in the drama because this is easy to do, just like in life. It's, you know, just stay away because drama can weigh you down like an anchor. Hmm. And, you know, stay from that in the politics and everything. And just keep your eye on the prize. And no matter what happens, don't let anything stop you from your goals and dreams in, in life, man. You know, happiness is everything. It's just stay strong. It's great advice, man. Um, looking back over your career, you got a lot to be proud of. And as I said before, you came along at a great time. You got to live out your dreams and, and you're still doing that today. And you've got a big career ahead of you, I'm sure. Um I, I don't know if you can narrow this down as we kind of wind it down here today, but it's, 
I don't know. Do you have a, do you have a favorite match? Do you have a favorite night? Do you have a moment where you're like, it's not going to get any better than this. I could leave today and it would be okay. Because do you have any moments that really stick out for you all these years later? Ah, uh, so many, so many. Oh my gosh. Uh, you know, some of the matches I had with Rob Van Dam were really, were truly amazing. Um, this is like uh, pre WCW and ECW, right? So, hmm. <laughs> so yeah, that was great. Uh, the matches I had with Bar- Barbarian were tremendous. Um, you know, I said, you know, sharing the ring with you know guys like Ric Flair, Ricky Steamboat, um, Ar- Arn Anderson, Paul Orndorff, uh, Ron Garvin, Jimmy Garvin, uh, who we used to team together actually. <laughs> oh wow. Um, yeah, and you know, Wahoo, Ivan, um, just being in the ring with the very best, you know, on uh, a national level, overseas level, um, from you know, the best from all over the world. I it, it's really hard to pick one, and I've had all, I've had all types of matches too. Uh, and of course, some matches. <laughs> Oh, it was a struggle to get through, but I mean, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, I just been blessed to, you know, all around to just been with the, with the very best and on uh, some great people. And then I hope I can give back, keep on giving back to help uh, some of the greats today. And whenever I see people that I've helped do well, uh, it, it really uplifts me because I, you know, I feel like I've had handed and I vicariously live for their happiness. So it's a really, really a great thing. That's good stuff, man. I don't think we could go out on a better note than that. Rob, before we get out of here is, uh, if you've got any social media you'd like to plug any upcoming projects, appearances, please have the floor, man. Feel free. Great. Uh, well, my official website is the stro.com T H E S T R O.com merchandise page. is the stro.com slash merchandise. I'm on Facebook at facebook.com slash stro the maestro. Uh, Twitter at Signs of Stro. Uh, my YouTube channel you can subscribe to youtube.com slash Stro Maestro. Uh, I'm on Twitch, <laughs> free gamers, twitch.tv slash Real Papa Stro. Uh, WCW Retro um, podcast every Thursday night at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on vocnation.com. Um, I'm going to be in, I mentioned earlier about the devil's daughter film i'll be starring in uh for more info go to facebook.com slash real devil's daughter uh i'm also uh in the dust starring in the dust series as the chief which you can check out all three seasons on avail tv at availfilms.com which is a b a i l films.com or on the dust uh series youtube channel just youtube.com slash dust series uh, I got a horror movie coming out this coming year called Stench of Iniquity, which I betray a ancient vampire named Abba. Nice. In the film, which, which you can check out. More updates for that with facebook.com slash Stench of Iniquity. And I got some uh, I'm upcoming miniseries and pilots in the works, so uh, I'll definitely keep your body informed. But, uh, yeah, keep in touch with me. Let me know how you guys are doing, and I'll definitely do the same. And, uh, yeah, thank you guys for your love and support, man. Always, always. Rob, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Don't go anywhere. I'm going to take you off screen for just a second and say goodbye to the kids. Everybody, thank Mr. Rob Kellum for showing up here today and for hanging out with us for a little bit. Rob, thank you again, my friend. Oh, th- Thank you all. All right, kids, there you go. The maestro himself, Mr. Rob Kellum. Uh, uh, small little glitches aside, it's technology, baby. What are you going to do? It happens to me here in the office all the time. So uh, we hope you guys enjoyed the show. This has been, of course, Tom Clark's main event. Thank you, as always, for hanging out with us here today, uh, for showing your love and support to the show and to Mr. Kellum. Please go check out all of his social media. Um, and let's make it happen, kids. Get out there and support the man, all right? He's he's put his time in the business to entertain fans over the years, still doing that today. So, yeah, go show some love. He's one of those guys that we talk about here every week on the show. So, yeah, go out give him a follow Give him a like, check him out, give him some good positive feedback. I know he will more than appreciate that. All right, man, we're going to get out of here. Everybody have a great weekend. We'll be back next Friday as always here on the show. 
We appreciate you guys hanging out with us as always and for making this show fun as you do each and every week. Be safe, be happy, be healthy out there. Wear your freaking mask. Let's get back to life, kids, because I'm ready. I know you are. Let's get out of here, folks. Thanks again for hanging out, kids. We'll see you next time. Tom Clark's main event.